So we're getting ready now in our playlist on analysis to move on to multivariate analysis. And in this video, we're going to discuss a really important and really famous inequality called the cauchy schwarz inequality that is really important in multivariate analysis. Loads of things will require this inequality in their proofs. So this is a video devoted to this inequality and we'll prove it in this video. So the inequality is about two n-tuples of real numbers, which of course are going to be vectors in our n-dimensional Euclidean space, Rn. But for now, we don't even need to worry about thinking of them as vectors. We can just think of them as n-tuples of numbers. So you need two of them for the cauchy schwarz inequality. So we've got one n-tuple here, which is a collection of n real numbers, x1, x2, all the way up to xn, where n is some natural number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. The inequality works no matter what n you pick. And these entries, all of the xi's, they're real numbers. And then we've got our second n-tuple of real numbers, y1, y2, all the way up to yn. And again, all of those entries, the yi's, they're all real numbers. The cauchy schwarz inequality is then this inequality, that if you look at what the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of xi times yi, where this means x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2 plus all the way up to xn times yn, and you take that squared, what you have there, whatever real numbers you pick as your xi's and yi's, it will always be less than or equal to what you get if you take the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the xi squares times the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the yi squared. So just to say what these two things mean explicitly, this is y1 squared plus y2 squared plus what, sorry, x, sorry, x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way up to xn squared, and this one is y1 squared plus y2 squared plus all the way up to yn squared. So if you multiply those two sums of squares together, what you get will always be greater than or equal to what we have here. So this inequality then that I have boxed in red, this is the famous cauchy schwarz inequality. Now, initially when you look at it, it looks quite complicated. It looks as though it's going to be difficult to prove as well. It's not actually. There is a very beautiful, simple way of proving it, uh, and we'll come to that in a moment. But firstly, let's just have a look at it, and I want to convince you that actually at least when n is 2, or when n is 3, and we're then talking about two tuples or three tuples of real numbers, or if you like, two-dimensional or three-dimensional real vectors, then this inequality is something that you will be familiar with in a much more simple form. So start by looking at this, and now think n is equal to 2 or 3. Then what we've got here, the sum from i is equal to 1 to n, x i, y i, this is a formula that you might be familiar with for the dot product of the two vectors x and y. So then you've just got like the dot product squared on this side. Then look at these two things here. Again, imagine n is 2 or 3. This is what you might be used to as the square of the modulus of the vector x, and this is the square of the modulus of the vector y. So now if we take the square roots of both sides of this inequality, which thankfully because the square root function is a monotonically increasing function, it, well, it's strictly increasing, more than just monotonically increasing, but it's strictly increasing, uh, it means that we don't need to worry about this inequality no longer being true when we take the square roots. Uh, indeed, we can take the square root of this side and this side and the inequality is still going to hold true. So this then says that the dot product of x and y is going to be less than or equal to, uh, when we take the square roots, we'll now have the modulus of x times the modulus of y. So this is this inequality written in terms of things that you will be familiar with from um, basic study of real vector spaces and calculus. Now, when we go to more advanced parts of maths, and indeed when we go on to multivariate analysis, that's counted as a more advanced part of maths, you stop calling these sorts of notions these same names as you learn in more basic calculus courses. So the dot product gets a new name, which is called the inner product. And we no longer talk about the modulus of vectors. Instead, we talk about the norm of vectors. And instead of writing it just with one um, line on either side, we write it with two lines on either side. But I'll introduce you to this in subsequent videos where we talk about Euclidean space. Uh, but 
here is this inequality written in sort of basic calculus notation that the dot product of the two vectors x and y, and I've underlined these because they're representing the vectors, is less than or equal to the modulus of the vector x times the modulus of the vector y. And this is an inequality that you should accept is true because if you remember the definition of the dot product of x and y in two or three dimensions, it's the modulus of the vector x times the modulus of the vector y times the cosine of the angle theta that's in between those two vectors. And remember, cos is always between negative 1 and 1. And when the angle is 0, i.e. the two vectors are parallel, pointing in the same direction in two or three dimensional space, then cos, then the theta will be 0 and cos will be 1. When they're anti-parallel and the angle between them is 180 degrees or pi radians, then cos of that angle theta will be minus 1, and you'll get a minus value. And for all of the angle thetas in between those two extremes, you'll get something in between. And you can see, therefore, that it is true that the dot product of x and y will always be less than or equal to the modulus of x times the modulus of y. It'll be equal to that when the angle between these two vectors is 0. And then for all other possible thetas, it will be smaller than that. And actually, you can make a slightly more precise statement than I previously had written. You can say that the absolute value of the dot product of the two vectors x and y is going to be less than or equal to the modulus of the vector x times the modulus of the vector y. And hopefully, again, that's obvious if you remember the geometrical definition that I've reminded you of here of the dot product of the vector x with the vector y in either two or three dimensional Euclidean space because as I say the two extremes will happen i.e. the equalities here will happen when either theta is zero or theta is 180 degrees and for everything in between you won't get equality you actually get that uh, the modulus of the dot product will be smaller than the modulus of x times the modulus of y and this actually makes more sense coming from this because, of course, when you square root both sides, you won't get a, a negative answer here. You'll get the absolute value of the dot product of x and y because the square root function always gives you the positive answer, not the negative answer to what squares to give that value. Anyway, so that was not a proof of this inequality. That was just to show you how this initially daunting looking inequality relates to something actually that you already know and have learned in simpler parts of mathematics. In particular, when you were studying vectors, you probably saw the dot product a lot. And when you were studying vector calculus, you probably used the dot product a lot. So we're now going to see the proof of this, which isn't going to use geometrical ideas whatsoever, which of course is important because we're going to prove it for arbitrary n-tuples, and it gets more difficult to argue things geometrically once you're up uh, into dimensions 4 and beyond. So as I've said, this looks as though it's going to be a real pain to prove and take ages, but it isn't. There's a beautiful trick for doing this really quickly. Firstly, let's just look at a special case, and the special case is where either the x n-tuple is all zeros, or the y n-tuple is all zeros, or both of them are all zeros. And I've denoted these n-tuples by x and y, and you'll note that I've dropped the line underneath that we use in applied maths to represent vector. In analysis, we often don't bother putting that line underneath, we just call our vectors x and our vector y, which is what I'm doing here. So if this is the case, then let's start with this case where the x n-tuple is all zeros. You can see this thing's going to be zero when all of the xi's are zero, because uh, for i is equal to 1, you'll have x1, which is zero. If i is equal to 2, you'll have uh, x2, which is zero, all the way up to when you have xn, it'll be zero. So everything's going to come out zero. Similarly, this thing's going to be zero because you're adding a bunch of zero squares. Um, and then this side will go to zero. So you've just got zero is equal to zero. So the inequality holds true if the x n top is all zeros. And you can see the same thing's going to happen if the y n top is all zeros. This one will go to zero and this will go to zero again. So again, you'll just have zero is equal to zero. And if both of them are all zeros, then again, obviously it holds true. This is zero, this is zero, this is zero. So you've still got zero is equal to zero. So the inequality does hold true in these special cases. Now we can assume that 
not this isn't the case, so we'll assume that our x n tuple always has at least one entry that is non zero, and our y n tuple always has at least one entry that is non zero, and we'll prove the inequality now. So, this trick to prove this is going to be that I'm going to create a quadratic function. So, it's going to be a function that's real valued and is from the real line, and I'm going to define it and we'll call the independent variable u, so f of u is equal to the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of xi times u plus yi squares, squared. So writing this out, um, so for i is equal to 1 you get x1 times u plus y1 squared plus x2u plus y2 squared, that's i is equal to 2, plus then you'd have i is equal to 3, which is x3 times u plus y3 squared, plus all the way up to the nth one, which is xn times u plus yn squared. So this is quite a complicated polynomial in u, but if you were to expand all of these out and then simplify the whole thing, we'd just end up with quite a complicated degree 2 polynomial. So our function f is a quadratic function defined over the entire real line. So let's now try and expand it out. So we'll go back to the more grown up form up here. So we've got sum from i is equal to 1 to n. And then for each i, we can expand this and it will come out as xi squared times u squared. That's what we get from this times itself. Then the cross terms, so we get two of those. So we'll get plus 2. And then we get xi times yi times u. That's what you get when you multiply that with that. And you get two of those. So that's that bit. And then finally, this one times itself, so we'll get plus yi squared. So now what I want is a polynomial where we have some coefficient of u squared, some coefficient of u, and then some constant term. So now I can just think about splitting this sum into the three bits, this bit, this bit, and this bit. And then I can pull the u squared out of this first bit, so we'll get that the coefficient in front of u squared is the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the xi squared plus, and then here we've got sum of this from i is equal to 1 to n. Again, we can pull the u out because it plays no part in the sum. It's there in each one of the things that's being summed up. So we'll then get that this is the coefficient in front of u, sum from i is equal to 1 to n of 2 times xi yi, and then finally, the constant term is just going to be the sum of all the yi squareds. So sum from i is equal to 1 to n of yi squared. So this is the final quadratic function then that I end up with in u. And you'll see that the coefficients are the things that I'm interested in, the things that appear in my Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Now, we're about to have a break, but just before we do, let me point out some things that are going to be important in our future manipulations. Firstly, that the coefficient in front of u squared is not equal to zero, because I've said we've already proven the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for those special cases where the x n tuple or the y n tuple are all zero. So in particular, we know that the x n tuple is not all zeros. And if you look at this thing, sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the x i squared, these are all non-negative, the x i squared. They're only going to be zero if one of the entries is zero. And when one of the entries isn't zero, they'll end up being positive because you're taking the square. So you're adding up a bunch of non-negative things, and at least one of these things that you're taking the square of is not equal to zero by our initial assumption. Therefore, when you add that bit in, you're going to get something that is greater than zero. So this thing is strictly greater than zero, uh, but in particular, it's not equal to zero. It's also not negative, but n not being equal to zero is what I'm going to want because I want to divide through by it. So I'm going to be able to do that by the fact that it's not equal to zero. The other thing that I want you to note is that my quadratic function is always going to be greater than or equal to zero at every single u value in the real line. Why is that? Well, go back to the original definition of it as this thing, you'll see again, whatever u value you take in the real line and plug in here, you're taking the sum of a bunch of squares. Now, it might be the case that for certain u values, these cancel out and become zero, but um, even if that is the case for every single one of them that they're coming out as zero, the thing you end up with will be zero. You're never ever going to end up with a negative number. 
because you're taking the sum of squares. The smallest these things that you're adding up can be is zero. And if they're all zero, then the function will be zero at that u value. But or else it will be a positive value. But in particular, we can conclude that it's always greater than or equal to zero for all u is an element of the real line because of its definition as the bunch of a sum of squares of real numbers.